Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 2, and verse. Ajishyanti manushyastvam Sarvakam avareshvarim Dupopahara balibi Sarvakam avarapradam Translation by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. By sacrifices of animals, ordinary human beings will worship you gorgeously with various paraphernalia because you are supreme in fulfilling the material desires of everyone. Srila Prabhupada's purport. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, 720. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender unto demigods. Therefore, the word manusya, meaning human being, here refers to one who does not know the actual goal of life. Such a person wants to enjoy the material world by taking birth in a highly elevated family with the benefits of education, beauty, and immense wealth, which in this material world are desirable. One who has forgotten the real aim of life may worship Goddess Durga, Maya Shakti, under various names for different purposes and in different places. As there are many holy places for the worship of Krishna, there are also many holy places in India for the worship of Durga Devi, Armaya Devi, who took birth as the daughter of Yashoda. After cheating Kamsa, Maya Devi dispersed herself to various places, especially in Vindhyachala, Chala, to accept regular worship from ordinary men. A human being should actually be interested in understanding Atmatatva, the truth of Atma, the spirit soul, and Paramatma, the supreme soul. Those who are interested in Atmatatva worship the supreme personality of Godhead, Dashmin Vignate Sarvamevan Vignatam Bhavati. However, as explained in the next verse of this chapter, those who cannot understand Atmatatva, Apashita Atmatatvam, worship Yoga Maya in her different features. Therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam 212 says, Shatavya Dini Rajendra, Nirnam Shanti Sahasrasa, Apashita Matmatatvam, Griheshu Griha Medinam. Those persons who are materially engrossed, being blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth, have many subject matters for hearing in human society, O Emperor. Those who are interested in remaining in this material world and are not interested in spiritual salvation have many duties. But for one who is interested in spiritual salvation, the only duty is to surrender fully unto Krishna. Sarva dharmam paritvaija me mamikam saranam raja. Such a person is not interested in material enjoyment. Om Magyanti Virandasya Gena Nasa Kavaya Shaktun Militam Jena Tasme Sri Gurave Nama Sri Krishna Shetanya Prabhunichananda Sri Advaita Sri Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Again, very loudly. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Shikapa to Rubius Chapi Pishindu Vivi Chapa Titanum Pavambio 
वैष्णवेव्यो नमो नम हरे कृष्ण गुड मॉर्निंग The condensed purport of the purport of this verse is not that worshiping demigods is altogether an illegal activity. Um, nor is it um, actually condemned in a general sense. However, there is an understanding of the actual role of demigod worship, and therefore there is a way to discern who should worship a demigod, why they should worship the demigod, what is the result of worshiping the demigod. And then when that is assimilated, it is understood that those people who are materially exhausted are those people who are desiring liberation, our freedom from birth, death, disease, and old age, for those persons who have understood the futility of returning again and again to this material world, these persons take to the worship of Lord Vishnu, of Krishna, and they don't compromise their life's energies and their minds by worshiping demigods who can only award fruitive results. The demigods cannot give liberation. This was um, especially understood in the pastime of Hiranyakashipu and Lord Brahma. So everybody is, I'm sure, familiar with that story that a very powerful personality of a demoniac or ungodly, demoniac meaning those who are adverse to Lord Vishnu, or they are indifferent to Lord Vishnu, Krishna, God. Um, these people are good candidates for worshiping demigods. So here on Yakasipu, he was such a candidate, and he was all, all, already a very powerful personality. Generally, powerful people will want more power. And less highly placed people are those who are maybe in an ordinary level of activities of life. They're struggling just to make ends meet. So they'll be worshiping in terms of getting some kind of material relief, you know, new house, new car, new wife, education, pass an exam, etc. But Hiranyakashipu, he had it all already, and he wanted more. And he also was intelligent enough to understand that all good things come to an end, like your life. And he reasoned that he'll lose all of this at the time of death. And that's a fact. So he determined the best way to hold on to everything is to live forever, perpetually. Now, in actual fact, everyone lives perpetually, lives forever. But we live forever, eternally, in our eternal spiritual form. The, the spirit soul is never slain. The spirit soul doesn't die. But the spiritual form is distinctly different from the material form. And that was the missing link in the reasoning of Hiranyakashipu, because he was thinking, I want to remain forever as I am and increase my wealth. So he worshipped Lord Brahma. We do not find so much um, descriptions of worshippers of Lord Brahma. And in India, there are very few just a handful of temples for Lord Brahma. Generally, people 
are worshiping Lord Shiva and are forms of um, Durga Devi, Maya Shakti, like that. So he went to Lord Brahma and he made his request. He had one request. And, uh, you know, if you've ever seen the Lord Nishringadev dramas, you see there he is in front of Brahma. And he goes, I want to be immortal. I want to be immortal. So that was his request. And Lord Brahma, with his four heads, which maybe gave him four times the amount of wisdom than the ordinary demigod, he, he explained to him, well, this is impossible. I, I cannot give you immortality because even I don't have immortality. You know, if somebody makes a request of you, um, give me this, give me that. Okay, if I have it, certainly I can give it to you. It's within the realm of possibility. But if I don't have it, then there's a problem. How I can give it to you. And that means either you must get that thing in order, that object or that thing, in order to hand it over, or else you have to be honest, like Lord Brahma, I don't have it. I'm not immortal, and therefore I cannot give this to you. So then, being a very um, innovative pers personality, very clever, Ranikashipu, um, because he was determined, he wanted to get his desire fulfilled. You know, he was on a self-fulfillment mission. He said, well, all right. Um, and then he started ticking off different... Um, different um, desire, different ways to approach this immortality that he thought would shield him from death. You know, I don't want to be killed by any man or any weapon. Lord Brahma said, granted, okay. And I don't want to be killed in the day or the night. Okay. Inside the house, outside the house. Okay, so many things. And when he got through his list, which he thought, you know, boxed him into the realm of immortality. He became very exalted, and he was very pleased with himself, you know, you know, like you see beating on his chest, I'm immortal, you know, he thought. And we all know he wasn't, <laughs> because it is simply impossible to outsmart the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And it is the Supreme Personality of Godhead who has actually laid down the rules and regulations and the structure of human life and indeed all life. Of course, he gave the duty to Lord Brahma to create all life and to create a situation wherein every living entity would have a place to live. But the master plan, the blueprint print, is coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, who declares, not a blade of grass moves without my sanction. So now this personality was thinking he had, you know, achieved his, his success. But unfortunately, as we know, actually it's Fortunately and unfortunately, and unfortunate, unfortunate for him because his desire was thwarted, but fortunately, um, the actual results of immortality as he was expecting them did not occur. The results of immortality according, according to Lord Krishna, according to Dharma, did occur. So in the end, he lost this form he had, the present form, he lost his kingdom, his wives. He lost his life. But by the mercy of the Lord, upon whose lap he was thrown and ripped apart, he gained immortality because the last thing he saw with these eyes that he presently had was the beautiful yet ghastly face of Lord Nishringadev, who was roaring in rage that this person would have been so insidious as to attack not only his own son, but his son who was a pure devotee of Lord Vishnu. So 
it is explained that anyone who worships the demigods, they have forgotten, or indeed maybe they never even knew what was the real aim of life, which is Atma Tattva, our worship of the personality of Godhead. And it means that the human life is meant for this purpose, to understand God, to understand our relationship with God. But as clear as this may be, there are still the bewildered living entities who cannot come to terms with this. And this bewilderment comes from their attachment basically to the mundane, to the basically to sense gratification. It can be there through lack of knowledge, and it can be there through simple stubbornness. But I don't want to give this up. <laughs> Prabhupada described it as dog-like stubbornness, that we don't want to give up our place in this material world. We want to hang on, because somewhere down the line, I know I'll really enjoy I'm suffering now, but somewhere down the line, I know I'll really enjoy. Uh, the fact is, that's true. If one gives up the spirit of enjoyment separated from the Supreme Lord, then one will really enjoy. But in the bewildered state of life, um, the human being he doesn't know what is the actual goal. And um, even when presented with good arguments or good reasoning, because of this deep attachment, which creates this layer of bewilderment, they cannot understand this Atma Tattva. So they worship various demigods. Um, so accordingly, one who is interested in remaining in the material world and or don't have an interest in spiritual salvation, then they will remain in this predicament. This predicament means they will, they may even attain some kind of high birth, education, beauty, etc. But it's all, all a temporary phase. And it's dependent upon their actual, um, their actual, interaction with the demigods. So after a certain point of time, one who is actually intelligent will see the futility of these activities and they will change their um, direction and they will come to the actual level of worshiping Lord Krishna. Um, and people who are worship Lord Krishna, they're not actually interested in material enjoyment. It's not a primary focus for their life. So this is kind of a quick summary of the purport. And then I was um, speaking yesterday. I was in California, and I was speaking with Vaishiseki, and I told him, well, I have to give a, speak about this verse. Can you give me some some enlightenment on this verse. So he had given me a few verses to um, describe the, um, or enhance the purport. And uh, in reading one of these, it's actually from Srimad Bhagavatam 7523. Um, there's a very interesting comment uh, well, first in the in the translation, it says, "As long as one is not satiated by fruit of activity, and has not awakened his taste for devotional service by Shravanam Kirtan of Vishnu, one has to act according to the regulative principles of Vedic injunctions." So this is actually um, interesting because we see nowadays. That and, and you know, on the one hand, we're saying it's better to worship Lord Vishnu and put the demigods aside, which that is um, clear if one wants to get out of the material world. But if one is somewhat attracted and not ready to let go, and feeling the need to satisfy all their material desires, then actually, what Hirani Kashipu did was right. He went to a demigod. He worshipped a demigod according to Vedic injunctions. And um, Srila Jiva Goswami, he, he is 
you know, understanding the, sci the psychology of people who are attached to the material effects, material um, aspects of life, even though, you know, just like when we have the 10 offenses to chanting, one of the 10th offenses to remain attached just, um, to material objects or material life, even after having understanding so many instructions on this matter. So we know we've heard, we've somewhat understood, but somehow we're not ready to just let it go. You know, it's like a person who has this burning coal in their hand and is burning them, but they just won't let it go. You know, it's foolish, right? No. But still, um, that's the, the uh, nature of the covered living entity. But somewhere down the line, if I just hang on, I'll get that enjoyment I'm after. So Jiva Goswami points out, when a person fully surrenders to Lord Krishna, he takes shelter of the Lord's promise to liquidate all other responsibilities and debts of the surrendered soul. So then the, the um, devotee becomes fearless by meditating on the Lord's promise of protection, that we don't have to worry. We're not going to lose anything by giving everything up and worshiping Krishna. There is no loss. Um, but then he points out, conversely, those who are materially attached, they're frightened, they're scared of the prospect of full surrender. And this fear actually is an underlying inimical mentality toward the Lord. You know, sometimes even devotees will say, okay, you know, I want to serve you, Krishna, I want to give everything up, but maybe not everything <laughs> right now. <laughs> maybe we can have, you know, a strategic planning, we'll phase it in, we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll phase out my surrender, you know, and maybe down the line, so, you know, little by little. Um, you know, it's a good idea, it's better than no plan at all. But Krishna's saying, just give it up. Just give it up and surrender. And don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. Prabhupada, from the very beginning, would tell us, you know, why do you have to worry? Krishna's taking care of every living entity. Just see the little ant and the elephant. Both are being maintained equally by the mercy of the Lord. What do you, the devotee, have to fear? What is there to worry about? And even if he removes something from your life that you're so attached to that it's great pain to have it taken away, that is even further proof of the Lord's mercy toward the devotee that he sees, oh, this wonderful person wants me, but this person is so much attached to this one object or this other person or whatever it is. If I take it away, that will remove an obstacle from their path of devotion. And one who is actually somewhat advanced, one who has some gratitude in their heart for the Lord, will be very grateful. Thank you, Krishna, even though there may be some pain involved or some bewilderment even, but thank you because you know what I need and you've removed it. And one who is actually not so ready to surrender will become angry. They may even become inimical. They may even just leave the service of the Lord because they can't understand how could this happen to me. So worshiping the demigods is a bona fide activity for those who are materially engrossed. And on a very high level, devotees can worship the demigods if it's connected to Krishna. There's a couple of examples of this. One is the, um, when the cowherd men had come to execute the ritualistic functioning, they were going to worship Shiva and Ambika. And during that time, um, this, um, the reason they were going to worship Shiva and Ambika was because they wanted to become more attached to Krishna. So in this way, there was a bona fide aspect of worshiping the demigods. But they were very highly elevated souls, the cowherd men of Raj. And uh, 
the goddess, the gopis, they also, they also were worshipping Katyani one time a year, somewhere around the time of Kartik. All the unmarried ladies who would like to change their status and become a married lady, they worship Katyani. That is on the materialistic side. But on the spiritual side, the gopis were worshipping Katyani to get Krishna as their beloved husband. So the residents of Vrindavan, they were not ordinary personalities, and anything they did was simply to get more and more closer to Krishna, to, um, to and that type of activity, that is, that is considered approved activity. This, this Prabhupada is mentioning in the Krishna book. This is related in Krishna book in the 34th chapter. But if one comes, then Prabhupada says, but if one goes to the demigods for material or personal gain, that is condemned. So that condemnation is specifically meant for those who claim to be devotees of the Lord. If you claim to be a devotee of Lord Krishna, then... You can only worship Krishna. You don't need to go through his agents. The demigods are the agents of the Lord. And they're for those persons who haven't somehow or other crossed over the threshold of seeing, of desiring only a relationship with Krishna, desiring only to have pure devotional service. So those persons who are not ready to sacrifice their lives on behalf of Vishnu, then those persons, they, they can worship demigods. It's not a high-level activity, but it's a regulative activity. And as such, it's better than persons who have no object of worship and, and don't follow any type of, um, any type of um, restrictions or regulations. They just simply... Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending according to their whim. Yeah. And this is unfortunately a huge percentage of the population of the world. That no restricted activities from birth to death. Just simply get out there and enjoy. I saw one foolish advertisement was saying, you know, it was for old people. So it was in a magazine for old people. Now I'm like one of these old people. So they send this magazine. I was looking through it. And it's like so pathetic because it's all about trying to enjoy. Like, you know, do you remember when you were a teenager or a young person and you could just get up and do this and do that? And a lot of it's like, you know, sexual activities are just thinking, you know, hey, why should you give that up? Just keep on going until you drop, you know, party till you drop. And... You know, how sad to see, you know, that from birth, death to, to old age, one is simply interested in um, unregulated sense gratification that at the best will scratch an itch and guarantee you rebirth again into the material world. You know. So, on one hand, to worship the demigods for these type of persons is um, probably better because at least there is some hope of coming to the level of worshiping Krishna. And just like those who worship Lord Shiva, if Shiva sees, here's a really sincere soul, this person is actually, he's eligible, he's a candidate for Vishnu, then he will make some arrangement to bring that person to Krishna. But for those who are hopelessly addicted to sense gratification, they just recycle themselves birth after birth um, into one species of human, one species of life or the different species of human life. So therefore it's recommended that those who are little intelligent just worship Krishna. And in that way, um, you'll actually... There's another verse that it says, whatever, whatever your material desires are, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Just go to Krishna. 
Now you can say, well, we're, aren't we told that we shouldn't go to Krishna for our material desires, you know? And on, yeah, yeah, on the high level, on the high end, that is correct. It's like we, you know, that story of the washerwoman who had a big bundle on her head and the bundle falls off and there's Krishna and he goes, oh, Mataji, can I help you? She looks up, yes, can you pick up this load of laundry and put it on my head, you know? Like, he could have totally freed her from carrying laundry on her head and having to go down to the river and beat stones on the cloth, you know. But because she was constricted in her worldview and her self-understanding, oh, yeah, just pick up that bundle, you know, let me carry on. Um, but nonetheless, she got, she got the mercy of the Supreme Lord. So this in one, you know, one way or another, you won't lose. Um, if you worship Krishna, and if you ask him, even if you have a material desire that somehow or other you're not ready to pass over, better you ask Krishna, because Prabhupada, I can't remember the purport, but in the purport, Prabhupada says, because even though you're asking Krishna for something material or mundane, still you're remembering Krishna. And eventually the desires will be purified also. So the verse, by sacrifice of animals, ordinary human beings will worship you gorgeously with various paraphernalia because you are supreme in fulfilling the material desires of everyone. So in the wrap up, the material desires can be fulfilled by Krishna, but the um, real desires, the real interest, the real self-interest is atmatatva, knowledge of the supreme, which will lead us to the platform of pure devotional service. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <clears throat> uh, I have a question about the addiction to the material world. And that is, uh, well, I worship Krishna now and I'm addicted to the material world. And uh, I know it's a long process. I got a long life to go. I'm getting my gray hair now. So I, I understand that it's, it's a long process of chanting Hare Krishna. However, uh, sometimes the two things kind of meld. For example, when I had my son, I had a material desire I needed to fulfill. And I needed to dovetail my material desires toward Krishna consciousness by having this child. But sometimes the line is blurred, and, and within my heart, I can't see through the blurry line of if it's actually what I'm doing is Krishna conscious, or am I still just uh, satisfying my addiction to the material world? Sometimes there's a blurred line there. <clears throat> what I want to know is, how can I clear that line up, like, like practically speaking, because over a period of time, now I've now I've you know I've been here for twenty years, and the line is still blurred, you know, and I don't know if it's uh, blurred because as I get older, uh, the way I want to perform my Christian consciousness changes, or my material desires change, so therefore there's always a blurry line. But actually, I I just want the line to be clear. Uh, and I, because it, for me, I think if the line was a little clearer, I could focus on, on my Krishna consciousness better. But while, the, about, but while that's blurry, it's hard to tell whether I'm really focusing on Krishna in my heart or me in my heart. You, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You know, when you look through the binoculars, and sometimes when you pick up the binoculars, they're kind of, it's blurred at first, and you have to, like, twirl the wheel, and it clears up and see clearly. In order to see clearly, you have to have an object to focus, right? You know, you have to focus, you have to, like, pinpoint the focus, the binocular in one object, and then you clear it up, you see it clearly. It's only blurred 
when you're not sure where you want to go, what you want to look at. So just what I had mentioned, what Jeeva Goswami points out, that those who are material, uh, materially attached, they're actually frightened by the process, prospect of full surrender. There's an underlying fear. We haven't accepted that if I give up everything for Krishna, he'll protect me and my family and every, everything about me. So, you know, you're walking that blurred line you're chanting, you're following, and at the same time, there's some other, another aspect. It's the gray area. It's up to the living entity to focus, to absorb in Krishna, and then the blur clears up. So in the beginning, absolutely, the dovetail process is the recommended way. I want this, I'll offer it to Krishna. But as time goes on, we really want to find out what Krishna wants. You mentioned having a son, and I'm sure you have desires of, you know, a grand life for your son. And you have things you give him, and, you know, you have plans for his future, our hopes for his future. Now, the son may have, you know, some other ideas, Right. You know, especially as a child, like let's say a small child, I don't know how old your son is, but let's just say he's a, a little small child, five years old, and uh, you get him, you know, a, 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 I don't know, some, something that's inappropriate, like something that's inappropriate for a five-year-old in that it may be the, it's meant for an adult person. So it's like over the head of the five years old. And it's his birthday, and he's, you know, kids want something like that they want, but he gets something that's very valuable, but it's over his head. So he won't quite be satisfied, you know. Whereas if you say, you're, what do you, you know, the parent, what do you want, my, you know, my dear son, what do you want, or the, you know, the parent's attentive. So then when you give the person what they want, they're very, very happy, you know, instantly. So, of course, in the material world, your happiness is followed by distress. But anyways, just to get the, the point of there. So, you know, in the same way, we want to find out, Krishna, what do you want? I really want to give that to you, because if you really want to please, you'll accept the dovetailing, you know, because it's, it's bona fide. But there's some distance between you and Krishna when you dovetail. But when you come out, Krishna, what do you want? And you try, even if it's imperfectly um, orchestrated, but you're really trying to give him what he wants. You get closer. And that blur diminishes. So it's really up to you to decide what you really want in this life and what you want for your family. You know, because, um, you know, having children, for example, is very, very... Enormous responsibility, materially and spiritually. But actually, it's stated in Shastra that one shouldn't have, one shouldn't, you know, take, take that responsibility of marriage or children if they're not prepared to offer them the ultimate gift of liberation from birth, death, disease, and old age. So the enjoyment is there in a family based on the love and affection, and that's not to be denied, but there's another responsibility that has to be considered. And that responsibility of offering Krishna and giving Krishna consciousness is the activity that brings us closer to Krishna and the activity that will diminish the blur. So, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hi, Krishna. Thank you so much, Manchi. My question, um, it relates to the class from yesterday. And uh, Vishwam Prabhu he mentioned how um, worship of Krishna with material desires is offensive. And he gave the example that just like a child with their parent. Um, a child with a what? Hmm? A child with a... Parent. Parent, okay. Mm -hmm. 
with the parent. Um, just like if a child is asking, okay, mom, uh, yeah, I need you to feed me now. Okay, mom, I, uh, yeah, and I need all these things, and you know, like that. He said it's very, um, what was the word that he used? Uh, he said it's insulting to constantly, for, for the child, because the child, actually, the parent takes great joy and happiness in supplying everything the child needs. So I just wanted to hear from you, since this verse is following that same line, again, um, a little bit about how to get free from that offensive um, mood and purify, you know, ourselves. I mean, if there's some, you know, insight that you have on that. Well, Prabhupada gave a very simple explanation. <laughs> you know, you keep chanting, you keep serving, you keep hearing. In other words, by practice of Krishna consciousness in the right mood, we will be, the, the material desires will diminish because we'll be associating with Krishna as opposed to our material desires. So you can say it's offensive to worship Krishna for your material satisfaction, but still Prabhupada says it's better than going to the demigods or not worshiping Krishna. Now, if you don't change that consciousness and you're always and forever worshiping Krishna for material satisfaction, you're not going to make tangible pro progress. It'll be less apparent, your progress. So in that way, it's, you know, you can say you're not making the best use of your time, you know. But still, it's better than those people who totally ignore the Supreme Personality of Godhead, right? His prophet said, at least you're saying, Krishna, give me this, Krishna, give me that. So you're remembering Krishna, as opposed to just pulling it off the shelf and going right for the enjoyment. You know? He gave an example um, to one devotee. And the, the, the situation was this person had been a sannyas, He'd fallen away, had gotten married, and now he came back to Srila Prabhupada, but he was feeling very, um, very, you know, sheepish and humbled. And he didn't go sit up in the front. He was sitting at the back of the room, and Prabhupada saw him and called him up. He said, oh, you have come back. And he was still feeling overwhelmed by his, his situation. Prabhupada could sense this, and he goes, it's all right. He says, Krishna consciousness is like playing a mridanga. The more, you, the more you beat it, the better you'll become. The more you practice, the more you practice, the better you'll become. So with that understanding, um, we can also understand that, all right, we may be on this materialistic platform full of material desires. We didn't come here, we didn't land here because we're pure devotees. And we have to start somewhere, and we have to keep going. Determination, enthusiasm, and patience. These are the three elements that Prabhupada said. All three must be there in order for there to be a result. And if anyone is missing, then the full result won't come. I wrote this in a letter to Dina Tarani. Thank you. Did you say enthusiasm, patience, and conviction? Is that what you said? Did you say enthusiasm, patience, and... Enthusiasm, patience, and determination. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada. Ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam. Ki jai.